Alright, we're on the subject of the qualifications of a biblical leader. I missed last week, so picking up where we left off the week before. And uh, one of the texts I want to start with tonight, it's not where we ended, but it's, I want to go back to a scripture that we visited earlier, and it's found in Colossians chapter 3 as a kind of a reminder of what we're talking about here tonight. We're talking about the qualifications of a biblical leader. And it's very important that you, as a Christian, understand that leadership requires dedication. It requires discipline. It requires prayer. It requires um, staying attentive to the Word of God and the things of God and make sure that you get all the dross and excess out of your life. So, um, and I was reading uh, some things today that's going to tie into this, and I'll share it with you in a minute. But we're going to go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 first. It says, in verse 5 it says, Mortify. Anybody know what that means? You know what a mortify means? It don't just mean put to death. It means to utterly put to death to where it cannot become alive again. It means to completely eradicate and destroy. (laughs) Uh, You can put something to death and it come back. You know. Well, maybe not you, but I mean, mean, Jesus had some things that uh, he put back to life that had died. So, but when you destroy something, you know, it's gone. I mean, when you utterly eradicate that thing, you're getting the root, you're getting the the not only the the surface part, see, we put that part to death, you know, like in, for example, in the springtime, we got spring coming up here, um, we have weeds coming up in our yards and stuff of that nature, and we'll get out there and get that uh, fertilizer out there, and we'll get that weed and feed out there, and it'll put those weeds to death, per se, but after a while, you have to keep doing that because if you don't, what happens? They grow back. They come back. Okay? And that's the idea here. But when you get down in that thing, Brother Chuck, and you get down into that root, and you pull that root out of there, there ain't anything coming back. Okay? It's gone. Mortify. Therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Now look at what he names here. Your members. He's dealing with the fleshly realm here. And in that fleshly realm, he has to identify and address certain things. What are they? Fornication. I'm not going to back off of this. I'm going to tell you exactly what the Bible says about it. It is a sin. Let me tell you something. It is a sin for two people to shack up that are not married. That's fornication. Amen. You can amen or not, but it's the truth. Amen. If you're having sex with somebody and you're not married to them, you are sinning against the Lord and you are doing harm to yourself in the eyes of God. You've got to keep yourself spiritually pure and sexually pure. They connect to each other because when you have sex with somebody, and I'll get very graphic for a second, when you have sex with somebody, you are connecting and joining yourself to that person, not only physically, spiritually. Whatever's going on with them spiritually becomes a part of you. Now, a lot of people don't know that. You become one, the Bible says, when you join yourself to a harlot, to her. And when it it says one, what it's talking about there is it's talking about you become one and everything that's going on with that person, it interlinks into your spirit. You bring their world into your world and you bring your world into theirs. And if you're not equally yoked, it is going to bring chaos, confusion, and a mess. And if you don't do it the way God told you to do it, it will create problems for you that you could never imagine. 
not just the physical, forget the physical for a minute. Everybody always focuses on the physical, HIV, herpes, AIDS, or whatever you want to call it that people can get out here running around. Forget that. We forget the part that the actual fornication does to the spirit of the man. It warps his spirit. It warps her spirit. And when you bring two people together that are not in holy matrimony, God will not bless it. He will curse it. That's right. Amen. Okay? Well, we're living in different times. It don't matter about different times. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and He has not changed His mind on this subject. I know TV pushes it. I know the world pushes it. I know a lot of people in church today have turned a blind eye to it. I know a lot of people in church today think there's nothing wrong with it. There is absolutely something wrong with it. And this church will never change its stand on it. Fornication is in the same class as adultery. It is hated by God. And God tells you to mortify your members. Destroy that thing. Don't allow it to have a root in your church, in your home, in your family. You got children? Don't let them shack up together. <laughs> I know a lot of parents that will let their boyfriend and girlfriend come and stay with them and live with them. Not be married. And they're Christians and they're, and, and they're setting that example to these people and they're telling them they're Christians but then they give them the Blind nod to that. You know what you're doing? You're mocking God. That's what you're doing. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord until culture tells us different. <laughs> yeah, I'll fix it. Hmm? <laughs> That's the attitude. I, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord until the talk and the view and Sharon Osborne and Whippy Goldberg and CNN and Fox News and uh, Madonna and uh, uh, Beyonce and the rest of these uh, nut jobs get in here and say, hey, it's okay. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Or Joel Osteen's of the world said, well, I really don't talk about it. Well, it's pretty obvious you don't. <laughs> yeah. You know. You've got to keep yourself pure, folks. Next thing he says, uncleanness. It goes right into that same category. Okay? And then he goes on. And he says, inordinate affection. Do you know what that is? Inordinate affection. That means to have an affection for something that God hates. Preacher, I don't think it's wrong to marry two men as long as they love one another. Preacher, I don't think it's wrong to join these two women together as long as they love one another. You know what you're saying? You're saying that God is okay with inordinate affection because that's what that is. When you have an affection for something that God hates, God identifies that as inordinate. And if you allow that to go on in your church, in your music department, or whatever department, because let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you something that might shock you. It may not shock you. I don't know. But I, know, I, I get around. Okay? I talk to the brethren. I know, what, I know what's going on out there. It may not look like much, but I know a little bit. There is 60 to 65% of your gospel singers in the church world today that are homosexual. 65% identify themselves as being queer. 60, listen to the number. I didn't say 65. I said 65%. Of the gospel music world, which which genre? Take your pick. Whether you talk about southern gospel, whether you talk about contemporary gospel, whether you talk about modern gospel, or whether you talk about traditional gospel, it does not matter. The statistics go all the way across the board consistently. Now, how did we get to a place in the church world where we have 65% of our people that are getting behind the pulpit, getting in pianos, getting in the music department, and playing music to our children, playing music to our churches, and singing about how they love God, and going out and having inordinate affections one toward another? And the preachers don't care. Wow. That's a problem, folks. 
That is a huge problem. To the point where you got to understand something about music. Music, listen to this, I'll say something else here. Music is spiritual. And if a person that's playing the music ain't right spiritually, they are going to put something in that church that is cursed. I don't care how much they sing about Jesus. Amen, amen, amen to that. Inordinate affection. You better mortify it. Evil concupiscence. Um, extreme sex perversion and deviation. Sound familiar? That's what evil concupiscence is. Sex perversion. So what would that include? Well, you know, you got your pedophiles. Who in their right mind, let me tell you something. I'm just, I told you I'm going to be blunt tonight now. In graphic, this might not go on YouTube. Thank God. But we got another platform now, so it won't matter. Let me tell you something about this deviant generation we live in. There's something wrong with a man that can look at a child and get a sexual thrill out of it. Amen. That is a that is the worst kind of perversion you can come up with. You got that right. But it gets worse than that if it's even possible. You know what it is? Getting out there and having sex with the animals, which is what they're doing now. <laughs> Try this one. Getting out there and doing the stuff with the uh, dead bodies. You say, where's that going on? Here in America. <laughs> right here under your nose. Right here in the state of North Carolina. You don't have to go to California to find this stuff. All you got to do, pick you up a newspaper or pick you up the daily news and you'll read all about it. But you know what's sad about that? While that's going on, out there we think, the same kind of spirit has entered into the church. And the same kind of spirit that is out there, we're allowing it to get in and play to our children. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Alright, the next thing he says here. This is the part I want you to pay attention to. This is really what I was going to zero in on. And what? Covetousness. Covetousness. That's what the subject is. We're still on the subject. Covetousness. But I want you to notice what he says about covetousness. What does he say in that next part? Which is idolatry. You better underline that and put a highlight by it. And never forget what that is. He just told you, he gave you the definition of what covetousness is. It's idolatry. Go to Ezekiel chapter 14. Now this is what the Lord showed me today when I was reading and it's a scary thought and I put a note in my Bible my blue Bible at the house what I was reading at work I need to put it in every one of my Bibles and it's found here in verse 1 chapter 14 verse um, excuse me yeah, chapter, one, uh, chapter 14 verse 1 then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols, where? In their heart, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. There's your TV. There's your internet. There's, there's your Bluetooth. All this junk that people constantly put in front of their face. To pervert themselves against God. Tick tock. I, I was talking to a guy at work today. He said, you know, they got a thing now where you can sue Tick tock and Instagram and Facebook and all these guys now for loss of time and wages because of all the time you spent on these uh, networking devices and the loss of income and all this junk. I mean, listen to me, folks. It's a time stealer. Looking at stuff that is absolutely foolish. Think about it. All 
these little bit nitpick videos that they're always putting up. Stupid stuff. And the world is entertained by that, understandably so. They don't have the Spirit of God. But what concerns me, what bothers me, what is troubling to my spirit is the church has got on the bandwagon and they are allowing this device, devices, these platforms to steal all their time away from the things of God and the work of God and the, and the ministry to spend all their time putting that stumbling block before their face and let it tell them how to think and how to do things. It is a wicked thing. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. Only thing that's different is the way Satan presents it. But it's the same thing. Listen to this. These men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of all by them? Therefore, speaking to them, now pay attention to verse 4. You want to make a note on verse 4 and 5 because this is so important you remember this. Therefore, speak unto them and say to them, this is scary, folks. Thus saith the Lord God, and he means exactly what he's getting ready to say. Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet. Now listen to what God says next. I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols. Do you know what God is saying there? That is a dangerous place to get when you get to a place when you start praying to God and God says, I am going to basically deceive you and I'm going to answer you according to the idols that you've got in your heart. I am not going to answer you by my word. I'm not going to answer you by my spirit. I'm going to answer you according to your idols. Now you think about that. You better get them idols out of your heart. I put a note on the top of my Bible. Prayer. Lord. Please, gently, and I put that word gently in there just as a reminder that I'm frail and I'm human and I'm weak. Lord, gently, please take away all the idols that may be in my heart that would hinder me from coming to you and getting an answer that is right. And when I pick up this book, I remember years ago, Brother Ruttman said this. He said, when you pick up that Bible and you read it and you open up those pages, God will answer you according to what is in your heart and that's what you'll come away with. Amen. And that is profound, but true. Verse 5. Well, let me, let me finish reading. The Bible says, uh, Every man of Israel that setteth up his eyes in his heart and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him according to the multitude. Notice that word multitude there. It's not just one thing. It's several things. Of his idols. That I may take the house of Israel in their hearts. Because they are estranged from me through their idols. Now, how does that connect to what we're talking about? It connects like this, folks. If I'm a preacher, and I am, I'm happy to be one. I'm honored to be a called preacher, a God called preacher, and that kind of thing. But here's what I'm seeing in the ministry today and in the pulpits across America and around the world. These preachers have become estranged from God through their idols. And when they come to their congregations, they answer the congregation according to the idols that are in their hearts. They don't tell them the truth anymore. They don't want the truth. They don't care about the truth. Truth is irrelevant to them. What is relevant is how can I make you feel good? How 
how can I tickle your ears to keep you enticed to keep coming back? That makes me look good. See? How many did you have? You know, I can't tell you how many times I've had that question. How many did you have, Sunday preacher? How many did you have? 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 I had 500. Well, I beat you. I had 600. Well, that was great, but I had 1,000. Not one time in any of those conversations is there a question about what was preached, the depth of the message, how the people responded to the message. Was there any conversions to Jesus Christ? Was there any people that were drawn back to the Lord that had backslidden? Is there anybody that come back in fellowship with the Lord? None of that's asked. It's a numbers thing. It's a business. The Bible says here that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me. How? Through their idols. And folks, if we're honest tonight, including this preacher, we all have idols that we need to get out of our hearts. Every single person needs to reflect on that and make sure. That's why I put the prayer at the top of that page, that page that that verse was in. I said, Lord, please. And I put gently. (laughs) I know how the Lord works. (laughs) Make sure my prayer was specific. (laughs) Gently (laughs) remove. Because you know me, (laughs) these idols, any idols, no matter what it is, get it out and replace it with what you want. Please take that to heart. That is so important. We pray that as a church, this church. I'm talking about, I can't change the world, but I can help what's going on here. And I'm I'm responsible for you guys. And I want you guys to understand that's a good prayer that you can pray every day. And ask God, Lord, please get these idols out of my heart. And replace those idols with your word and your goodness. Alright, now, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And let's look at some more references on these idols and this, uh, and this covetousness. Now notice that the covetousness and the idol worship is the same. Why is that? Because when you start coveting something... You are willing to do anything that it takes to get it, include violate God and His Word. Now, did you hear what I just said? You're willing to stay out of church. You're willing to quit reading your Bible if it takes it. You're willing to compromise. You're willing to put your spouse above God. You're willing to put other things before the Lord. See? You're willing to put that television program before God. I'll just stay out today and watch this program. After all, it only comes on once a year, and, and I don't want to miss it. Or the Super Bowl, you know, it's on Sunday, so I'll just stay home and watch that, and, and I'll just miss church, and it ain't going to be a big deal. Well, that one service that you miss, that one message that you miss, is that very message that God may have wanted to speak to you about something specific in your life that would have been a game changer for you, and transformed you, and changed you, and been an amazing difference in your life, and you missed the blessing. And God does things like that. Faithfulness is what God rewards. It's not quantity. Listen to me. It's not quantity that God's looking for. It's quality. Faithfulness goes under the category of quality, not quantity. You understand what I'm saying? And if we stay faithful in the little things, God will reward us in the big things. Even when it's not easy, even when it's hard and not popular, you have to stay faithful. Listen, there's been plenty of times, y'all know what's going on with me right now. There's been plenty of times when I've been in this pulpit and I've been in such excruciating pain, but I didn't show it because I wanted to be faithful in giving you the word of God. And in that moment of pain, God blessed me. When I get responses from the congregation afterward, knowing the blessing that it was to you and how it fed your soul, 
See, that's what's worth it to me. Knowing that I was faithful in what God wanted me to do in that moment to do what I needed to do to get the Word of God across to you. If I could not preach today, Brother Earl, I would rather die. And that's the truth. Now, my wife would tell you that. <laughs> if, if today you told me you can never preach again, preacher, you never read your Bible, <laughs> Be over. Lights out for me. Take me home, Jesus. I remember Brother Ruckman right before he died. He had a message he said, and this is what he said to us. He told us, he said, listen, the day I get to the place, now are you committed? The day I get to the place where I can't read this Bible, and at that point, they had a Bible on the pulpit. I saw it. I saw it in his office when I was in his office and I saw it on the pulpit. They had it in three or four volumes. And each page had letters that were that big of the scriptures that he was reading. That big. Letters. And he was reading it. Give him another. <laughs> Read that. Some of it he had from memory because he had a photographic memory, but other things, he just wanted to look at it. And he said, the day, gentlemen, the day I get to the place where I can't read this Bible, I want to go home. And you know what happened, Brother Chuck? He got to a place where he couldn't read his Bible. And it won't but just a couple of months after that, he died. We got the phone call when we got home. He passed away. Am I right, Carrie? I mean, he went away. That was amazing. Are we that committed? Or do we have idols in our hearts that prevent us from being that committed? Is there some kind of covetous desire that keeps us from wanting all that God wants for us? Listen to what he says here now. 1 Corinthians 6. Covetousness is idolatry. It's a simple, I mean, it's, it's profound when you get that revelation on what it means. And then tie those scriptures together like that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10 says this. And I think we talked about this last week. I think actually this is where we ended last, last time we got together a couple weeks back. Go back to verse 9, though. Know ye not. That the unrighteous, everybody say unrighteous. unrighteous. I'm going to tell you something about some Christians that I know. I know a lot of unrighteous Christians walking around today. You say, what do you mean by that, preacher? I thought we had the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. We do as far as our salvation is concerned. But there is also something in the scriptures taught called personal righteousness. And that's a daily thing that you have to work out in your salvation. You know the Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's dealing with your personal righteousness on a daily basis with God. And that personal righteousness you're going to be held accountable for on how you conducted yourself from the pulpit down to the pew. And the Bible says here in verse 9, Know you not that the unrighteous, and he's going to give you a definition of who these people are in a minute, shall not inherit. Underline the word inherit. It didn't say they would not enter the kingdom of God. It said they would not inherit the kingdom of God, which means that they're not going to have a rulership in the coming kingdom that God's going to present and put on this earth in the millennium. Who are they? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. Christians, if you get caught up in that stuff, you are going to lose your inheritance. Who are they? Idolaters. Isn't it interesting that the next word he says is idolaters? Nor adulterers. He puts idolaters before the adulterers. <laughs> Nor effeminate. We know who that is. Nor abusers themselves with mankind. We know who that is. That's the queers. The effeminates, the transgenders of the world. Bruce Jenner and all the rest of them. Nor thieves. That's the people that refuse to pay their tithes. <laughs> I'd stick that in there. Nor covetous. 
No drunkards. That's the man that don't know how to laugh the bottle. See? No revilers. That's these people that run around and always want to correct the preachers. Remember Paul was before the leadership and uh, they said, you, you speak this way to the uh, high priest of God. And he said, I, know, I did not know he was the high priest of God uh, because the scripture says that you should not ru- uh, revile the ruler of God's people. You better be careful how you handle the preacher. Because God will handle you. And I've warned people about that before. Nothing wrong with going and talking to the preacher. Nothing wrong with having a question. Nothing wrong with um, maybe having a disagreement on a doctrinal issue. Or anything. That's not what we're talking about. But how you approach him and how you handle him. Remember, God put, and I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about any God called preacher now. Understand that. Listen, any God called preacher is in the pulpit, be careful how you talk to them and how you handle them. Because God will handle you. Because he put them there. They are God's watchdog. As Ruckman said, he was his junkyard dog. <laughs> you got to be careful with that. Alright? Gets to a point where they just get out there and left it leave. Go somewhere else. You know? Alright, the Bible says, No extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now that covetousness is found in verse 10. And the Bible tells you that if you've got a covetous heart, you are not going to get that inheritance. So it would behoove us as preachers and leaders in our churches to know that, understand that, and guard against that. You know, don't put the temptation to be covetous in front of people. What, what, what kind of things would that be in the modern church world? Oh, the, the prosperity gospel. There's a good one. <laughs> the health and wealth gospel. The name it and claim it crowd. I've seen them get so ridiculous, Brother Jack, that they would go out there and stand at some stranger's yard and point in their yard and say, in the name of Jesus, I claim that house for myself and my family and God's going to give it to me and I believe God's going to give it. You know what that is? You're coveting something that belongs to somebody else. But because you put a bunch of religious language around it, a bunch of religious jargon around it, everybody thinks you're being spiritual. You know who teaches that stuff? Kenneth Copeland, Gloria Copeland, uh, Fred Price, Kenneth Hagen, TBN, CBN, (laughs) all the rest of them. Yeah. Yeah. Prosperity gospel. It, it's the fruit of it that has produced what we see today in the church world. And now we've got a landslide. I was watching a, a thing on YouTube the other night with some preachers and it's gotten worse than I could ever even imagine. <laughs> it's got to the point now, I saw this on the video the other day, oh, you appreciate it. I'll see if I can find it and send it to you, where uh, Creflo Dollar is promoting candidates for the for the um, for government that are pro abortion, pro queer, and he has no problem doing it from his pulpit. And another one that's doing it is T D Jakes. He has no problem having an issue with churches that promote pro gay lifestyles. He has no problem with it. T D Jakes, he's in every airport. This is what they say now. He is Oprah Winfrey's preacher. That's a problem. Yeah. That should be a red flag right there. I honestly... I might get in trouble for this. I honestly think he's a closet queer myself. Honestly. He looks like that guy off of um, that Medea movie, uh, the one that walks around with the tight pants with the bald head. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. He looks kind of like... That version of him. <laughs> and there's, something, there's some sugar in that tank too. But anyway, but that's the lifestyle they're pushing. Why are they pushing this lifestyle so hard? They're pushing it because we're getting closer and closer to the coming of the Antichrist who will be a queer. Ephesians chapter 5.
preachers, we got to, I mean, biblical leaders, we got to guard against this stuff. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. More specific here, but it kind of lines up with what you just read in 1 Corinthians 6, 10. Look at it. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, same as a fornicator, whoremonger is the male version of the female whore. Okay? A whoremonger is the male, and the whore is the female. Alright? And when you put the whoremonger together, you got both together in the same bag, and God condemns both of them. So the whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is what? He says it again right there. Hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God? Let no man deceive you with vain words. Doesn't matter what they say in their pulpits. Doesn't matter what they say in their writings, in their books, and in their speeches, and in their conferences, and in their one-on-one with you, and in their uh, motivational talks. The Bible says, let no man deceive you with vain words. They're going to come to you with enticing words trying to change what we just read and say there's nothing wrong with this stuff. And you're okay if you do it. And you're okay. We're in new times. This is America. What difference does that make? For because of these things cometh the what? The wrath of God. And I don't mean the love of God. Upon the children of what? Disobedience. Don't get caught up in that. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. That means you can be a partaker with them. When the wrath starts pouring out, don't get caught with your hand in the cookie jar. The Bible says, Be ye not partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now. Everybody say now. Are ye light in what? Walk as the children of light. So important, folks. When people start talking filthy, walk away. <laughs> Don't get caught up in that language. People do that to me sometimes. I'll smile at them and walk away. You know what I'm doing when I'm walking away, Brother Chuck? Praying. Yeah. Guard me against this junk, Lord. I used to be in that junk. I don't want to go back to it. Don't drag me back in that. I don't want to go back to that lifestyle. And it would be so easy to do it if you allow these two ears to entertain it. Because what goes in the ears and what goes into these eyes goes down into your heart, down into your soul, and that's where covetousness and idolatry starts is in the heart. We just read it in Ezekiel. It gets down to here. And brothers and sisters, when you get it in that heart, it is hard to pluck out. It's better to keep it out than to get it in there and get a root in there and then try to pull that root out. Get, keep it. Guard yourself from it. You don't want to go down that road. I went down a dark road for 10 years. A very dark road. And I struggle with things to this day because of that dark road. And I have to guard myself on a daily basis to keep myself from going back down that dark road. And I'm telling you, if I was to talk to any group of teenagers, young people, or anybody that stayed in church all their life and kept themselves holy and pure, I would encourage them, you stay with it. You don't get out of it. Don't let nobody talk you out of it. Keep your mind and your heart pure. And don't ever think that that road is a better road than what you're going down right now because it is not. Keep that heart. For out of it, the Bible says, are the issues of life. Take your Bible and look at 2 Timothy 3.2. 2 Timothy 3.2. I've got a burden today on my heart. Or well, put it on me today for some reason. I don't know why. It's just a heavy, heavy burden in my spirit because of where we are spiritually in this world, First Tim, uh, excuse me, Second Timothy chapter three. Look at verse one. 
This know also. He's talking to the preacher in 2 Timothy. This know also that in the last days, perilous. Everybody say perilous. perilous. Do you know what the word perilous means? It absolutely does. It means it means dangerous. Now, who is he talking to here? Is he talking to the preachers, the church, or the world here in this verse? I'll give you a clue. He's writing to a preacher. So he's telling his pastor what's coming. And he's telling him this perilous times that I'm telling you about is not perilous times for the world. They're already in it. It's perilous times for you because you are not in the you're not of the world rather. You are in it, but you're not of it. But these perilous, these dangerous times are going to come for you if you don't guard yourself against what he's getting ready to say. What does he get ready to say? Look at verse 2. For men shall be lovers of God. Their own self. Of their own selves. All you got to do is turn any preacher on TV on right now. Sister Debbie, and all they want to talk about is you. And how wonderful we are. How we're all created in the image of God, which is a lie. I, t- I told somebody today at work, they said, why, why don't you do a live stream on Facebook and why don't you uh, do this and that? I said, because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you. And I was very serious with her. I wasn't trying to be funny when I said what I said to her. I looked at her with a straight face and I was very, very serious when I said what I said. I said, ma'am, I'm a very controversial preacher. And I preach some very controversial things. I can't, I can't be on there like that because they'll take me off. I said, we're already battling things right now that they're taking off of my YouTube stuff that I'm putting on and we had to come up with another platform. I preach controversial stuff because the Bible's controversial. Amen. And I am not going to change that. Take me off the air, take me off everything. I don't care. I'm still going to preach it. Amen. John the Baptist preached it all the way up to getting his head locked off. He didn't stop preaching it. He told that man, you're living in sin, and if you keep living with that woman, you are going to be facing the hell and wrath and judgment of God. That's my paraphrase of it. That's basically what he said. He said, you're living in adultery. It's not lawful for you to have another man's wife. It's not lawful. Lawful. Don't matter what the world says. Don't matter what John Crawford did. I mean, why, how many husbands did she have? Eight? How many times did she get married? Elizabeth Taylor. It was Elizabeth Taylor. She got eight times. And the world just thinks that's wonderful. Well, I got news for you folks. It's not wonderful. <laughs> you don't change husbands like you change underwear. But Hollywood does. And guess what? Our children are watching that and they think that that's the way they ought to live. They think it's okay to go down to the courthouse on a drunken stupor and get married to somebody they met the night before and have an annulment two weeks later and everything's okay and God don't care. But let me tell you something. God does care. And when you're joined together like that in the eyes of God, God does not allow you to put that thing apart unless you've got biblical grounds. And there are four biblical grounds for divorce. Only four. And if you go outside of anything else to divorce somebody, well, I don't like him. I don't care if you like him or not. (laughs) Well, she burns my food every day. Well, go out and eat. Go get takeout. (laughs) That is not biblical grounds to divorce somebody. They divorce people over sneezing wrong. (laughs) Well, we outgrew each other. What does that mean? We have, a, we have all kinds of wild things here. And I told this lady, I said, Lady, I am not a preacher that preaches self. I am a man that preaches God and His Word. And when the Word of God goes forth, it divides. It creates enemies. 
That's why. The Bible says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Think about it. Selfies. Yeah. They're even using terms that go right back to the Bible and they don't even realize it. Let's take a selfie. You mean be a lover yourself? <laughs> That's what you're talking about, right? I mean, have you, have you seen how these young people, when they get up with their phones, Brother Jack, they'll, they'll take pictures of themselves getting out of the bed. I'm getting out, and they'll put a little caption up. I'm getting out of the bed now. <laughs> they'll go to the bathroom and they'll be brushing. Am I kidding, Carrie? I'm brushing my teeth now. Click. What is that? That is demonic. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. Boasters. They boast about their sin. You don't believe it? Go down to Disney World on Gay Pride Day. And you will see them boast like you've never seen anybody boast. They are proud of being queer. Now when I say the word queer, they get mad and say, you hate speech, you hate monger. And they'll put the big signs up and say, proud to be queer. You can say it. <laughs> Nobody censors that. I remember when Bill Clinton got in the White House, the queers got up and they said, we got our big blue queer eyes on you, Bill. Because he was deemed by Time Magazine as being the first gay president. Now, Barack Obama took that title later. But he was the first one that they coined that term with. First gay president. Why? Because he was the first one to get people like Janet Reno, Jocelyn Elders, and all the rest of these reprobates in there and put people in positions of power that would implement gay policy to the American people. And the policy went like this. We will first neutralize people's feelings about it. Then we will come in and we will bring programming in that will begin to subtly brainwash people into believing it's an okay and alternative lifestyle. Then we will put books in our public schools that will brainwash our children into thinking that it's normal to live like this. Then we go to stage two where we become aggressive and anybody that speaks out against it will be charged with hate crimes. Do you understand that what I'm doing in this pulpit tonight in some states in this good old United States of America could get me locked up? Just a little bit I've said to y'all tonight. Do you understand that there are preachers in America today that are behind bars for saying less than what I've said? In some states. I watched them drag a preacher out of a car no, excuse me. He, he was drug out of his church. I'm thinking about another instant. He was drug out of his church while on a Sunday morning service for hate speech because he was speaking out against homosexuality. Drug him out of the service while he was preaching. That's where we're at. Um, America hates God. That's where we're at. And that's why Paul tells Timothy here, we are going to face perilous, dangerous times. Now what are you going to do about it? Where is your heart? Are there idols in your heart keeping you from opening your mouth and saying the truth? Is there something in your heart that keeps you afraid, that keeps you covetous against the things of God and for the things of the world where when they come marching at that door right there or come in this yard or your house and back, back, bust down your door and come in your uh, home and say, you're going to have to renounce that stuff or we're going to put you in prison. What are you going to do? Because yeah. it's coming, folks. If the Lord tarries, this is what we're getting ready to face. The Bible says here, they'll be boasters. They'll, they'll boast about their sin. They'll be proud. 
you know, blasphemers, Netflix put a movie on last year on, uh, too bad I missed it, um, they put a movie on about Jesus and it portrayed Jesus as a queer and a homosexual lover and they were in there doing drugs and everything else in the movie and this is their version and they got up, the producers of the movie got up and said and we're going to put a lot more movies out like this. And where is the preachers that have the platforms on TV speaking out against this? I tell you, they're a minority. If they're even there at all, there's only one preacher. And I tell you, I don't agree with him theologically. I don't, I don't agree with his theology on Calvinism. I don't agree with his theology on the King James Bible. But I'm going to tell you something. I appreciate John MacArthur. And I don't agree with him. Now, don't misunderstand me. I think he's a heretic in his theology. But I appreciate that man being a man that stood up for his principles and beliefs and wouldn't let them shut him down when the COVID thing went. And he is not backing down on this stuff I'm talking about tonight. He opposes it, he's against it, and he fights it. Thank God for people like that. We need some people in our camp to do that. Amen. 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 Disobedient to parents. Let me tell you something, parents, grandparents. Go home and tell your children I said this. This is controversial, but it's the truth. Your children mouth off at you, slap them in the face. Amen. I mean, put it to them. Let them know that you don't talk to me like that. I'm your mom, I'm your daddy. You don't disrespect me like that. Amen. Put something on that backside to make them remember look, I got to respect authority and I got to love those that God's put over me. This disobedient to parents didn't come in a vacuum. It came as a result of the education system getting in here and brainwashing the people from the 60s and 70s and 80s and telling them that it's child abuse to do what God told you to do to your children when they get out of line. The Bible tells you if your child is disobedient, like if you spare the rod, you hate your child. I didn't write that. God did. Take it up with Him. Amen. But it seems to work pretty good for those that it's practiced on. And it seems to work pretty good making them rebellious for those that it's not practiced on. you got a little eight-year-old snotty-nosed kid telling their parents how things are going to be in the home. No, sir. Ain't happening. Right. My kid's tried that. He gets to the public school. He gets those things in his ear. He comes home and he tries it every once in a while. And I'll look at him and i say, what did you say to me? Who are you talking to? Because you ain't talking to me like that in this house. I'll put something on you, boy, to make the fear of God come in you. Amen. 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 I'm not going to have a rebellious child in my home. Amen. And if they get to the point where they think they know more mom and dad, they can hit the road. That's right. Amen. That's my other children. That was my philosophy with them. I told my daughter one day, I said, if you don't straighten up, I'll beat you till I feel better. <laughs> and she straightened up pretty good I, I got a phone call from the school one day from uh, my daughter's teacher she had been misbehaving in school and mouthing off at the teacher and when I got to that I went to the school brother Earl I went to the school went to the principal's office I said where is the class the teacher's class for such as that and she said it's down the hall this, I, she said what, what's going on I, said, I didn't even give her a chance I didn't even explain what I was going in there for I had my belt already out <laughs> It was ready. I walked down that hall. I knocked on that door and that teacher came to the door. I politely moved her out of my way. I went, I zeroed in on my daughter. I went straight to her desk. I said, if you don't straighten up and put yourself together and be, dis and be respectful to your teacher and listen to what she's telling you, I'm going to whip you in front of God and everybody in this classroom. Do you understand me? And she bowed and she said, yes, sir. I looked at the teacher. I said, you won't have no more problem out of her. And I walked out, and that was the end of that. And guess what? Never had another problem with her. Amen. Now, if more people would do right, instead of patty caking on his self-esteem is low, and you hurt his poor yeah. widow feelings. His self-image is being tarred by your whipping him. 
No, his character is being built. Yeah, amen. I'm building him into the man I think God wants him to be. Got a problem with it? <laughs> Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and on and on it goes. All right, let's go to another one. Got a few more here we can hit before we close. Proverbs twenty one twenty six covetousness. All this stuff is tied into this stuff, folks. These besetting sins, as they call them. And it starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. What did I say, good? Proverbs? 41, 26. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I told you wrong, folks. I told you wrong. Go to 2 Peter. I'm sorry. 2 Peter. We're getting ready to go back in time. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14. Second Peter chapter two verse fourteen. Covetousness. A biblical leader has to have some backbone and grit about him. Second Peter chapter two verse fourteen. Having eyes full of adultery. <laughs> well, what, what are we talking about here? Go back to verse twelve. But these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Made to be taken and what? Destroyed. Destroyed. Not promoted. Not put in political office. Not put in pulpits. They're made to be destroyed. Made to be taken and destroyed. Speak evil of things that they understand not. They, they open this Bible and they tell you that a better translation would be or a better rendering would be or the King James is unfortunate here the King James shouldn't say this or they'll attack that Bible from front to back because they're natural men that don't have the Spirit of God in them and they don't have discernment and they have no business holding the Bible in their hand to start with made to be taken and destroyed speak evil things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption they sure will and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure watch it to riot. Everybody say riot. riot. Do you riot. know that it is unbiblical for you to get out there and riot? I believe that. A Christian has no business out there protesting like that. Destroying people's property. Peaceful protest? Okay, I can go along with that. But getting out there like the Black Lives Matter crowd's doing and the Antifa crowd's doing and burning down cities everywhere they go, it's an excuse for them to be violent. They see everything that CNN, CBS, ABC, and all the rest of those quacks out there get up there and promote as news. They see as an opportunity to go out there and be violent. And they don't miss an opportunity. They are professionally paid to go to these cities and do these things. They are paid $21 an hour at one place I checked and $25 at another per hour to go out there and burn people's property and bust down uh, businesses and go in there and do what they're doing. Don't think they're there because of the cause. Because they're offended because some police officer has some brutality issues. It's not even got anything in the world to do with that. You don't believe it? Go look at their platform on their websites. Amen. They're using that as a smoke screen and an excuse. That's what communists do. That's what socialists do. And that's what Marxists do. The Bible says... And shall receive the reward of what? Unrighteousness. We just read that over there in the uh, other part. As they that count it pleasure to write in the daytime, spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Verse 14. Having eyes full of what? Ain't it interesting that it says the eyes there in that passage is full of adultery? You know what that's about? That's because these eyes right here are fixated on that TV set watching adultery day in and day out. <laughs> Days of our lives as the world twirls. You know, our stomachs turn. Where they glorify adultery. You see that woman back there? I love that woman back there. That's my wife. 
Ain't a woman in the world that can compare to that woman. Ain't a woman in the world that can turn my head like that woman. That is my world right there. That is my queen. And I'm not going to let some slut, floozy whore on TV or anywhere else turn my eye away from the prize to a slut bag in the slum somewhere. Amen. Amen. And that ought to be your attitude, men, toward your wives. That is what God gave you. The Bible says here, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Well, that means they're not converted. Because a man that's saved can. You may not want to. That's a different story. But you can cease from sin if you want to. Because you've got something on the inside of you that's greater than he that's in the world. The Bible says greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We have the power to overcome sin by the power of the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. The question is, are we utilizing them? This crowd here cannot cease from sin. The Bible says, beguiling unstable souls. They run around and find people that are unstable. Notice it says unstable souls. Who could that be? People that are not grounded in the Word of God. That's an unstable soul. Church, I'm telling you, leaders, if you get out on your own and you're teaching people and you're teaching them the Word of God and you're teaching them in your congregations, you better, well, the first thing you better tell your congregation or tell your group that you're ministering to, the very first thing on the top of the priority list, and this has been my top of my priority list every time I've been here, and y'all know this, y'all can bear witness to this, is the very first thing I emphasize to y'all is you fall in love with that book and you don't let anything replace it. Amen. That book is the most important thing in your life. Period. Amen. And if you don't make that your priority, you are in, you are entertaining unstable un, un, uh, souls. A heart have they exercised with what? Covetous practices. See how it goes right back into that. There's that covetousness again. Cursed children which have forsaken the right way. And we're going a little long, but I'm going to end with this one right here. They have forsaken the right way. What is the right way? There's two answers to that. And they both interconnect. Jesus Christ is the right way. Because He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But guess what? Don't you have the right way right here? <laughs> it's that simple, folks. When they get away from this, they got away from the truth. They got away from the right way. The Bible says here they have forsaken the right way. They've closed the King James Bible and said it's archaic. We don't need it anymore. And when you do that and you replace it with this new junk, you're going to get all this other junk that we're dealing with in America right now in American churches and around the world. That's why you have spirit reading cards at churches now. <laughs> you know what that is? That's nothing more than a fancy way of saying we've Christianized tarot cards. We brought the occult into church and we've renamed it. Hello, Catholics. <laughs> occult practices we brought into the church house and we've put spiritual names on them so you wouldn't recognize because you're too, you're too unstable in your Bible reading to recognize what that thing is. It's a demonic. You think you got to go off somewhere and get that? No, I used to work at SPX. I used to work right down the road at a place called SPX. And I used to have a church that we uh, were visiting for a little bit when we were trying to figure out things. And let me tell you what they did. They had people that would run out in the woods in churches. Remember this, Carrie? And they would go out there and the Spirit would come on them and guide them to certain sticks in the woods that they would pick up and then they'd take those sticks home and, and they'd polish them up and they'd carve things on them and then they'd sell them in the church and they'd call them spirit sticks. <laughs> Another church down here in Dudley. I'm just telling you right around the corner here. Dudley, I'm giving you some examples now. 
That's why I become controversial, and I, I don't make friends with a lot of brethren because they get mad at me. And we had another church where the lady pastor guy comes in, the lady pastor comes up to the pulpit, and she's preaching, and the other guy is sitting in the pew, and there's a ghost, according to them, sitting in the church, and the pastor dismisses it and says, oh yeah, that's just Fred, he's lived here for a long time. In the church. Pastor said it was okay. Nobody blinked an eye. You know what it is in the Bible? That's dealing with familiar spirits. You know what the Bible says about that? It's an abomination. And you're not fooled with that stuff. You know what you're supposed to do when you see some demonic mess like that? You're to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Not play around with it. Entertain it. Dismiss it. But because they have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wage. Oh, okay. Now we know what the problem is. Who loved what? What did he love? The wages of unrighteousness. The wages of unrighteousness. Ah, it always goes back to that money, Brother Jack. The love of money is always going to be the root of the problem. And when a preacher gets in the pulpit and he ain't got the guts to tell you the truth, it's because there's some money involved in it somewhere. Guarantee it. All right, we'll close on that happy note. <laughs> and we'll pick up there next time. Carry right down. Um, we're going to pick up with Exodus 18.21 next time, bud. All right, anybody got any questions on what we went over tonight? 1824 1821